A very warm welcome to my guests, to Jennifer Clement in Mexico, to Lissi Doran in Israel, and Hanno Rauterberg is in Hamburg. A corona safety measure that will accompany us during the whole book fair this year. And um, well, that's what we have to do, keep distance <laughs> and trying to discuss. My name is Barbara Walster. Let me briefly introduce my guests. Jennifer Clement is president of the International Pen Club, former president of the Mexican Pen, poet and author. Her last two novels, Prayers for the Stolen and Gun Love, were both published in Germany by Surkamp and the former about girl trafficking uh, in uh, Guerrero, Mexico, and the latter reflects America's obsession with um, weapons alongside with the fate of a 14-year-old girl. Lissy Doron, acclaimed writer in Israel, novelist from eight of her novels, seven, I think, are translated into German. And for the last two books, she has been exploring, let's say, the other side, so to speak, reality and history of the enemy, that is, of Palestinians, um, lately of a group of former Palestinian fighters and Israeli fighters, now forming together the combatants for peace. Hanno Rauterberg, a German journalist with the weekly Die Zeit, the art historian has, amongst others, published a book about questioning the freedom of the arts, new cultural struggles, and the crisis of liberalism, which is in some way also our topic tonight. Uh, in an uh, increasingly diverse world, the hegemonic positions in many fields are being questioned. In Europe and elsewhere, we can observe tendencies tendencies of cultural is isolation, demands for revisitions in museums or for of invitation modes for festivals, etc. Let's say we might call it new mechanisms of exclusion or even boycott. It seems to be a global trend in both liberal societies as well as in rather authoritarian ones. Jennifer Clement, where do you see the biggest challenge these days as far as freedom of expression and the arts are concerned? Well, I mean, what we're seeing everywhere is uh, a problem not only of censorship, but what we're very concerned about in Penn is also self-censorship. So um, the idea that uh, because you're afraid of attack, uh, you build bridges within yourself in order not to be attacked. So a kind of real concern for, for personal freedoms and personal expression happening pretty much every place. And why is it, Hanno Rauterberg, that art, visual arts, literature, theater as well, are being targeted so much, or the authors are trying not to get targeted and trying to self-censorship, as we just heard. OK. I think you have to differentiate very much between, and you already did it, between the authoritarian and the democratic regimes, and between those publics that are called free and those that are more or less repressed. And if you look at the repressed side uh, on, on those uh, countries that are not free, then usually it's the, those people who are in power who uh, tend to repress artists of all kinds, since they seem to threaten their power, obviously. It's, uh, we know this kind of mechanisms for years and years and or even centuries. Um, that people feel in a way um, that artists have to say something, tell the other people a truth that should not be heard. And one of the main protagonists of this kind of suppression is Ai Weiwei, obviously, who fled to the West. Then on the other hand, which is in a way more interesting, you have the liberal countries. And this seems to be a rather new development that you have uh, that you have certain groups who call themselves left and so who call themselves progressive and they still 
don't uh, respect the freedom of arts, uh, the freedom of expression as it used to be. And uh, lots of people use the new term cancel culture for that and uh, telling those people, those artists not to do th uh, certain things, not to claim certain cultural expressions for their work and all these kind of things we will probably discuss in detail later on. And I don't know about the reasons. The, f the reasons on the authoritarian side is quite clear, I guess. On the other side, I suppose it has Maybe it, there are similar reasons for that too. Maybe there are, there's also a feeling of being threatened in a way, being threatened in their dignity, being threatened in their sovereignty, being threatened in uh, their freedom. That uh, the old the old promise of living freely is not uh, fulfilled in a way that most people thought that it would be fulfilled. I could, we could maybe discuss about all these things in detail later on, but that might be one mode. But one, I was just, I just want to mention one thing is ca calling it cancel, cancel culture always implicates that it's culture still. Mm -hmm. And this is why I, I personally really don't like this uh, term. No, it's, it's no, that's absolutely true. I just said <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. it's used okay. in a, quite a lot right now. Um, uh, in my book, I'm using the term censorship from uh, beneath, whether uh, usually, usually you have the censorship from above and now you tend to have this kind of, and it's not censorship because people are not able to, um, to, to put off certain plays to, uh, to repress books or to, uh, they are not able to use the kind of power that uh, usually state officials have. They cannot put anyone in jail, for yeah. example. Yeah. So it's not the, not uh, have to, to really differentiate that. Uh, but as uh, was already said, there, there is lots of power in this kind of um, emancipatory or democratic processes and, and the, all the technical devices we have today, with all the petitions, for example, uh, they tend to have lots of power, as we see. I think we so are talking it, about it, that I, later on. Uh, I just want to uh, listen to uh, Lissy Doron. She has to add something to that debate, too, because having written about um, family history, family f situations and Holocaust for so long, and then you turn towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, that had a strong impact on your publication situation in Israel. How would you call the fact that your publisher refused to uh, publish your last two books in Hebrew? Censorship, boycott, what was it for you bes besides the vexation and the, and the economic threat maybe? I'm so sorry, but I feel that I don't have an answer, but I can share with you the story because maybe the story is a sample of shaky values and problem even in liberal and democracy. I think that people don't really understand what is consensus, what's right, what's wrong. We are in a day of a chaos of a, of a kind of rethinking and my story reveal the unclearness, if I may say, of the situation. I was a well-known writer in Israel as one who is responsible to tell the Jewish story, to tell what happened to my family in the Holocaust, to continue to be the uh, writer of the Jewish narration. And I thought that the Jewish narration should include also the story in the Middle East with our neighbors. And I was sure that I bring a sequence as a story that was in the past, the present, and now I want to build up as a writer a, a, a long saga of the Jewish story. And then I went to the occupation territories. I lived for three years, two days on a, a weekly basis with a Palestinian family. And I brought a story which I believe 
was a very important story to the Jewish narrative as well. And that was, first of all, a shock for my publisher, because for him, I have a totally different image. He was confused. He had no clue how he can sell the book. He looked at me. We couldn't talk about culture. He said, you know, publishers want to earn money as well. It's a business. No one will buy you this book because in Israel, they prefer to listen to their own story. No one right now is ready to read the stories of his enemies. So you should go home. Holocaust is selling well. Go home and continue write. You are gifted with a story and a topic. So this is really something that can give you a sample that publishers themselves, who should be my partners in creating culture, literature, or whatever, they are confused. They want to be secure. They want to continue to go on with topics they show they can sell it. And that was the first time that I realized that I'm working in a publishing house. I am not a writer. I'm not free. And I'm talking about Israel, which is a free country, which I have an illusion that there is no... Uh, limitation, especially we, the Jews, after the, the Second World War, we should raise our, our voice to give helping hands to others. And this was, for me, the first, uh, I think, uh, shocking event as a writer to understand that I have a wrong idea about culture and literature as well, and I have to build up my story in a different way. And what was interesting that the different way for me to express myself was to become a German writer because this was the only place that was ready to read the manuscript. And they said that for them, it's a very important book and they will take it. So it's again, it's not just culture, it's the history. They thought that it's important to give the whole story of a Jewish Israeli writer who is second generation. So I myself, I must say that I'm really confused. I don't really know what is right now the status of culture in the liberal uh, world and in other oppressive regime. And that's a question. I think that the spectrum of, of democracy right now, we can check the level via culture, but we don't have democracy and we don't have an oppressive dictatorship. For We have, of course, but we are working now on a spectrum. That is what my feeling. And in this spectrum, we have to create culture to spread or to deliver our own values of freedom, freedom of speech, of seeing the others, and etc. Jennifer Clement, um, confusion was one of the terms listed of one used, uncertainty of values. Do we have illusions about what culture can do in our societies? Well, I'll speak a little bit as president of Penn because I think that one of the things that mo that's sort of most extraordinary about Penn is how the founders uh, immediately understood that literature was humanity in search of humanity and that literature uh, had this potential to create social change. Uh, so in the charter, the opening line of the charter, which it gets sort of written in 1923, the line is literature knows no frontiers. So immediately they understood th this problem that we're talking about. Um, in, in the very first dinner, 
which was at the Florence restaurant in London in 1923, uh, there's, a, there's a diagram of the tables of receiving the foreign guests for dinner. And immediately you see when you look at that is that there's a table for Madrid and there's a table for Barcelona. So already at that very initial stage, Penn is grappling with, do we defend national literatures? Do we defend literatures because of language? You know, how do we define this? And as you, as you see the history of, of Penn over a hundred years, because it will be a hundred next year, you see how Penn is really uh, reacting to crisis, that, that in a way it's also the history of crisis. And so when does, when does Penn become political in the Second World War? And the declaration is that the organization is not political, it's supra-political, more than political. And this is when you start seeing the importance of literatures in exile. So after the Second World War in London, there are eight countries and languages, because Yiddish becomes also a language in exile in London. And then you see how Penn responds to the universal and creates the Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights, defending languages. And this is taken to, to uh, make a greater establishment with UNESCO and the United Nations. And um, Penn uh, develops consultative status at the United Nations. And then you go into more modern times and you see how Penn has responded to uh, the stories of Assange and of Snowden or to Charlie Hebdo or, or to uh, the Rushdie affair. And so now the way that we have responded to this moment is that we have created a manifesto uh, which defends the democracy of the imagination. So, you know, in this 100 year history, we're now at this moment where we are not just thinking of the frontiers of literatures or in our women's manifesto, seeing the threshold or the doorway of the home as a frontier. We are now discussing, you know, can the imagination have frontiers? And so our document, which I'll be happy to read if anybody's interested, it's all about the defense of the imagination and the terrible fear of how these attacks or censorship of publishers, et cetera, et cetera, can affect your the freedom of your imagination. So interesting enough. But is it, but is it I, I just wondered, I mean, um, because defending imagination, which in your imagination is something that happens within your head, isn't it? And um, in your head, you are still on your own, aren't you? I mean, you're, of course, influenced by all kinds of political, sociology, kind of society matters, whatever. Um, but still, I mean, who, who would prevent you? I mean, who would put up fences within your head? Is that really true? Or is it something where you just have to say as an author, OK, there are some very harsh resistances out there. There are some attacks, as you call it. Um, but I will stand up and uh, still stand up and uh, I will not be influenced by this or I, 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 I feel encouraged not to be in a way. Yeah, well, um, I think that one of the pen things that Penn will be looking into in the future, and I think that humanity in general will be looking into, is the ideas of privacy and internal privacy. I mean, when we think of art artificial intelligence and what is happening in countries like China, which is very, very scary, that there is a sense that we may be going to a moment when even our most quiet personal privacy may be at terrible risk. Um, the, it's, this is not looking good, this whole um, control of an authoritarian government on one's privacy. And the imagination is part of that. I guess Lucy Deron wanted to yeah, add wanted something. To, first of all, I, I was not aware of the freedom of imagination, and it gives me a very good feeling. But I have a question, because, and again, I'm not a specialist in this topic, but I was doomed to be because I experienced the fear of publishing a book against my society in a way. 
or to be boycotted by my society. It's hard to get my books right now in Israel. They stop selling even my Holocaust stories in high schools. No um, journalist in Israel is ready to have an interview with me, even those from the left side. So my, I was wondering who will take care was, on those people with free imagination. I was lucky enough to have my German publisher and my writing changed my whole life. We moved to Berlin. Uh, in Berlin, I am writer. My family moved with me. My husband has to leave his job. And you know, I'm, I'm talking from Israel, not from Russia, not from other dictatorship countries. I'm just a writer in a democracy, but I didn't follow the consensus. And there are um, events, even in uh, European countries, in which I have to go to a literature house with a bodyguard. And that is very interesting because I feel that my story represents the fragile situation of um, the people in a chaotic world that no one really knows where are the boundaries, what you can do, what is not allowed. And I think that many artists and writers they are checking the boundaries by themselves. And I, I'm lucky enough to raise my voice to tell my story. I know about other Israeli writers that were not as lucky as me. No one supported them. And they were really um, broken and they left the field, even though they were very gifted. So maybe it's a kind of a small laboratory, even for, for you both is dealing with this topic, to know that there are those small people, not the big shots that all the world know, but it's, it's always a kind of a, a fight between the frames of countries, people, values, and the freedom of imagination. And right now I feel, at least in my place, that more and more people with freedom in their head that are less brave to go forward with the freedom of imagination. And that's a problem. That's a problem for the human spirit. Uh, I, just one thing, I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I mean, I can understand that uh, artists, uh, that writers say they feel threatened in a way and that they feel endangered in their imagination and their freedom and so on. In a way, I can understand because as a journalist, I do experience similar things in some cases that people really get upset and I'm confronted with lots of aggression and all these kind of things. I don't want to say that uh, journalistic writing is the same as literature, not at all, but there are some similar reactions or some similar dealings with public opinion. But at the same time, I sometimes feel that it is a powerful thing too. I mean, for me, energizing in a way that you feel people are really watching what I'm doing. They are really reading closely. They care in a way, even if it's not a positive energy that I'm receiving. Uh, at the same time, it can um, be inspiring on a different level. You see what I mean? Uh, that it's, it's not, I'm not writing and nobody's caring. So that's my, something uh, where people and artists and writers too can th maybe think about what, what is it, isn't it also something constructive in a way to be able to put something out there in the world and uh, that will move people, that will uh, rise uh, certain emotions and uh, will, will uh, catalyze some, some processes in a way. Not that it's always positive, not at all, but maybe it's, it's, in the end it might be productive, I don't know. Well, in either or, I must say that in my case, it gave me a lot of power and energy, but because I had someone that gave me a helping hand, I know others which I try to support and push them, 
but they feel that they have no readers, you know, writers need a communication with readers. So the situation is uh, uh, very cruel to those people who had no one to push them. And that, that's the reason that I was very happy to, to hear about the deep understanding of Penn dealing with the spirit of culture and to let them go on and to, to take care for the idea. But completely... Absolutely, that's, that's something I would absolutely stress because for me it's the same situation. The newspaper has to protect me as an author uh, exactly. that I'm allowed to write a certain thing and publish uh, things that are not, uh, that may be debated, may in the end be debated very uh, roughly, of course. Uh, there, I think, there needs yeah. to be a protection and there need to be courageous publishers in a way. Mm. Jennifer. Yeah, I, I think there's sort of two things that are happening. And, um, you know, one is that because we're in a time that's brand new, that it's so brand new that we don't even really grasp it yet. But I think that, you know, because of social media and because of the globalization of social media, I mean, when you have been victim of these really horrific attacks, I mean, I do think, and especially I see it with women and and uh, women writers, is, is how, you know, it's just so much easier to just get off Facebook, get off Twitter, and not because you don't want to express your views, but the attack can be so horrifically violent, and and I don't and, I mean, want to diminish that violent. at all. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that you know when we think of attack and censorship, um, you know, certainly one knows that if you say certain things that, that, that an avalanche of hatred can fall on you. Um, and so this is sort of a new kind of exposure that we haven't really had before, you know. I think the role of the internet is crucial. We should talk about it because uh, um, frames was one of the terms Lissidron used. Um, we have more and more frames or framings um, through the internet and the, that means the global world is actually narrowing in a certain way. And um, strong interest groups that are forming, amplifying, let's say, compart uh, compartmental thinking. And that is what's what creates so, so quickly consensus or boycotts yeah. versus certain persons or art pieces or whatever. Yeah, and that was my second point, because I said there were two things. So <laughs> the other thing is that you can develop a community where you all agree with each other. Right. And you just, you know, and that to me is also, you know, horrible, because I am interested in speaking to people who don't agree with me. I think that's actually much more exciting than speaking to people who agree with me. I mean, so... So that's another thing that's happened. You, you see this sort of echo chamber of being able to be in a place where, where you, you all agree. Um, I mean, one thing that you see this very much in, the, for example, the supporters of Trump in the United States, they're all in this place where they all just agree with each other and agree with each other. And uh, uh, there's no sort of way to enter there. You know? Is this why- May I ask a, may I maybe ask a rather heretic question i mean is it maybe what true is heretic in these days are, <laughs> no i mean a, a question that maybe i don't know if it's uh, but but um if the art world in a way used to be an echo chamber too i mean that there was a rather um, elitist way of dealing the society of differences as what you called it um rather few people talking about what is valuable, what is supposed mm -hmm. to be good art, good literature and all that. And now we are facing a time where more and more people feel encouraged to say, no, I don't think so. They feel encouraged to say, I have my own opinion and I will call it out. And um, I totally agree that the way people call for boycott is absolutely destructive and, and uh, especially for writers and artists who are hit by this kind of hatred, it is, uh, can be really devastating. But at the same time, I think we have to consider this notion that there might be kind of democratization of arts 
and how we deal with that. And uh, I think in the end, we cannot tell, uh, we cannot say our art has to fit for everyone's mind. That would be ridiculous. It wouldn't be art anymore if everyone would agree and everyone would say, okay, I feel all right with that. Um, but we have to learn maybe to to argue and to to find new formats of discussing it would be one suggestion at, at least i don't know either well um i'm uh, i'm questioning the fact that if someone says uh, i don't think so uh, what is the what is the argument? I mean, uh, I yeah, don't think there aren't no arguments. That's the problem. That's the problem. There aren't yeah, arguments, yeah. and um, so uh, it's more it's more uncertainty uh, of the art piece versus truth of a personal Id identification or of a personal yeah. history or of a personal kind of feeling. Yeah, I just want to p make the point that. Um, Lots of people are actually arguing emotionally. They are saying, I don't feel well with that. I feel disturbed by that, and so all these kind of things. And um, ironically or paradoxically, uh, this kind of argument calling for or listening to their own emotions was brought up by the arts very much. The art, arts are always dealing with emotional values, and it's always was always a uh, also but not intellectual thing that too but also about listening to what is going on within me and uh, to see how am i feeling that's uh, that was used, used to be one major function of the arts at all so uh, in a way it might be that now in the outcome the arts are uh, you know uh, they, they they feel suppressed by something they brought up i mean I, I'm, I'm totally agreeing with what everyone said here that it's it's a devastating thing that people start to to call on the effects too but maybe it, it's more productive if we ask where is that coming from what is why are people uh, so keen to suppress artists works um, why are, are they not uh, going on the roads and call for political change? That would be, uh, why, why do they ask to boycott artists? I mean, and I think it might be because they, they feel that the political sphere, the democratic sphere is not as valuable, as transparent as it should be. And they feel that there's a powerful tool attacking the arts to uh, get their, their mis misunderstandings or to get their bad feelings uh, to the forefront. But if I may to go deeper with your questions in a way, I have always um, um, worries if there is a mythical image of the power of culture. Um, I it's don't true. really know if it's wrong or if it's right, if we prove that culture is so strong, but the mythical about the influence of culture is something that we got in heritage from generation. I'm not sure that the young generation have the same imprinting. I grew up with admiration to brave writers. And I think that I grew up also in schools and at home that I had a huge library, even though we don't have, we didn't have money, but we had books. And I think that changing the format of culture can make a change in the image. I'm not sure, but I see in my reading tools or in my meetings with readers, Looking, you know, at the average age, most of the people are not as young as I wish to see in my readings. And also because of the internet and all the media and platforms, I, I have a lot of um, discussions and I get a lot of emails from readers and I ask them, where are you from? How old are you? There are a few young people which are very challenging and interesting, but most of them are students that study literature. And most of the reader, and it can be also a kind of uh, a test, uh, are 
older people that grew up more or less in, in my era. And they discuss the same way and they have the same dream and the same wish about literature. And they see literature as a great influence. But now, I'm not sure after the escalation, and also I can see in Israel that we have less and less students in university that study literature. There is a change even in the positioning of literature in our education system. And I'm worried a lot because I still believe that humanity is the creation in our imagination and books and art is the way to deliver and to expose it. But I feel that we are now in a crisis, but I hope to be wrong, but this is a deep feeling that I have for the last years. Well, at least what we can see is a shift and a loss of identification maybe with these higher cultural values. Uh, I guess what Hanno Rauterberg resembled in, in his last book were mostly cases of young people, young people going against a poem on a wall, young people um, performing against a picture in a museum and so on. So. Uh, is there something like a generational gap that makes it more possible to say, I do not want this? No, in, in a way, the, all these are gestures of disrespect, in a way. And um, lots of people in the art world were always very keen to, to uh, bring up anti-hierarchical, uh, how do you call it, not non-hierarchical, no, I'm, my, my... I understand. Is, <laughs> what you mean. Very it's rusty, exactly. I mean, <laughs> what I mean is to pluralistic society, disrespect was very valuable, not obeying to what the state is saying, think for yourself, and all these kind of things were always connected within the classical cultural sphere. And now st uh, people start to behave that way. And um, what I want to say, I see you, all the problems that are connected with it. On the same side, I, I say it's a progress we are observing that people tend to say no and tend to say we want to have the canon, the classical canon that is represented in the museums and the theaters and the libraries. We want that changed in a way and that they are complete nonsense overreactions and all that that's absolutely obvious we don't have to discuss about that and maybe we we have to find ways to interact and and maybe we have also to to uh, ask why are people so uh, why are they so um, confused in a way at the same time i mean they're disrespectful but i think all we can observe is a is the longing for more clear frontiers again. I mean, they, we were talking about frontiers earlier, uh, and now people, uh, they, I always have the impression that uh, the, the arts are so much in the focus of these protests because arts, uh, artists and arts, uh, literature, uh, uh, painting and whatever, is full of ambiguities. And uh, without ambiguities, it wouldn't be art, actually. And uh, people have big problems dealing with all kinds of ambiguities today. And so they want to have clear and clear truth. They want to have clear borders. They want to say, this is my identity and this is your identity. At the same time, and that makes it so paradoxical, people always uh, pledge to mix up and say, okay, we don't only have male and female, we have all kind of uh, um, kind of different ways of sexuality. So it's it's uh, it's so uh, it, on the one side they call for more diversity. On the other side they long for more clarity and uh, for things that are not shaken. And that makes it so so confusing for everyone at the right at the moment. There are different notions going on and uh, crossing each other. In a way. I mean, I think I mean there has to be probably what we're working toward is spaces for everyone. So for somebody like me, for example, that is very interested in excellence of craft, I do like to read sonnets more than free verse, let's say, or I do appreciate 
uh, classical music and uh, all of these kinds of things, you know. But at the same time, I appreciate the other. I appreciate, you know, uh, people that, that are, are writing without any forms uh, and who are creating music without any musical knowledge. I mean, I think there's just room for all of it and that one should not ex exclude the other. And as an audience, you will find your place where you feel most comfortable. But just to go back a little bit, I just think that um, regarding literature not being taught in, in schools and things like this, I mean, the power of storytelling is, is immense. And, and the only way that we understand one another and can have empathy is by being in somebody else's shoes. You know, and, and so storytelling and literature and journalism uh, allows you to be inside the life of the other, which allows you to also hopefully um, have a, a more compassionate uh, response to, to the other. I always think it's so amazing that we all know the word xenophobia, but, you know, we don't ever talk about loving the stranger. It's all about hating the stranger. Um, so, you know, you can have shifts when you hear the story of, of, of a refugee. And, and, you know, when you read Buchani's book, for example, the Iranian Kurd that was on Manus Island outside of Australia, I mean, his extraordinary book. Um, how can you ever feel the same? You can't feel the same about somebody who practically drowns three times in a, in a little boat. I mean, and he talks about how in that terrible darkness on the waves and the terror, how everybody became each other's family in that boat. And suddenly you were sleeping on the shoulder of a stranger um, because that was the only shoulder that was there. I mean, the stories can tell us uh, these things, and that's why storytelling is so important. Yes, for sure, and I, I believe that we all agree, but the problem is at the moment you have a censorship that decides for you what books are allowed and what now. So we change also the, the, the big um, um, data or the, the big hope that literature will deliver. And I, I'm afraid that in these days, those who are censorship in most cases are politicians and politicians create um, a pressure on publishers and publishers create um, limitation or they choose subjects that are more relevant or goes with the values in a certain place. And this is one of the problems with the boundaries of literature, not the boundaries of the countries. Then we know what are the boundaries, but how we can break the walls via literature that's a question because I am a great believer. I think that my whole inner world and understanding of others came from literature. I grew up with, just with a mom. I, all the people were Holocaust crazy, survivors, post-traumatic. And in order to understand the world, I am so thankful to art and literature because they taught me how to understand the others. And I, I'm afraid that right now, there are no, there is no um, modalities that put literature in a way, or maybe I'm nostalgic, but I was born after the Second World War and the world then was much more open and people want to, to, to make changes. And but it was, breaking up the wall, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but breaking up the wall is one of the aims of many of the activists that we can observe. Breaking up the walls in a sense, in an institutional sense. If you look at the museums, for example, go to a museum, you'll see lots and lots of artworks by men, even in the contemporary sections. Why are men still so 
dominate, uh, dominating within this field. Look at the institutional boards. They, men are dominating it. White men are dominating it. So in a way, that is an issue too, where you have to say it's a question of power, even within the publishing houses, within the, or within the pen as an institution. Uh, how, how can you um, gain more diversity in these fields where very important decisions are made? Um, the problem starts for me at a point where people tend to take singular artworks and ask the artworks to be diverse in a way or to avoid any kind of cultural appropriation. And there it starts to me, for me to be not a political but rather psychological thing that I'm asking myself, why are people so much... Uh, uh, why are they so so much uh, obsessed with this idea of uh, some cultural values that belong to someone? I mean, why do they deal with these things as if they could own it, as if they had a copyright on cer certain identity markers? Uh, and uh, and my qu my first answer would be okay. Obviously, they feel in a way dis. Um, uh, what, what do you call it? They feel robbed in a way. Maybe they feel robbed by the internet world feel, uh, because the, all their data are, f are flowing into this uh, internet world. All their data is taken away. They cannot control what all the huge companies are doing with it. For example, it might be subconscious, but that they, they feel that their identity is taken away. And now they, they take the cultural sphere to gain and to re-secure it their identity, that would be one aspect. But the more important thing we should maybe discuss is, is the institutional side of it. And I think there really needs to be something needs to be done in that field. Could we say that um, the, the, the outside world, the internet, uh, provoked a, a real acceleration of very many processes and the institutions and the so-called liberal wa values uh, don't adopt. They are, they are behind. Is there a two velocity uh, situation that we do not quite understand right now? A lack of liberal societies, maybe. I agree. No, the society. No. Let's see. I agree. I feel that there are no there are parallel roads which need to come together one day and to uh, build up a new structure of society. But right, it, you know, now we have the political traffic and we have the internet and media traffic. And people feel free in the media tra traffic much more than in the political traffic. And we should find, I'm not sure that we, but the next generation should find a kind of um, balance, and I think that we experience the unbalanced situation. Yeah, and I think we've experienced a lot of unconscious bias. <clears throat> so, for example, I think that there, there, there are measures, you know, if we think institutionally that there are measures that, that can be taken. So, for example, in, in musical orchestras, one of the most fascinating things was that they found that you know, in general, women musicians were not being hired for orchestras. And then they realized, oh, well, what if we do an audition, you know, behind a screen? And then they even realized that the, the, the people holding the audition, either the conductor or the director of the orchestra, um, was listening for the high heels. And so women had to stop wearing high heels because behind the screen they would hear the click, 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 click of the heels. And then they would say, oh, that's a woman violinist. The minute the women took off their heels and auditioned behind the screen, suddenly the orchestras were filled with women. So for example, um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in prizes, we've studied this a lot in Penn. Uh, for example, uh, when women do win prizes, which is not very frequent, but now it's becoming more frequent, but, uh, like, for example, uh, almost invariably, in like 98% of the cases, women's books that win prizes, the protagonist of their book is a man. So there's subtle things like this that occur. 
um, that we have to become aware of, you know? I mean, how many protagonists <clears throat> of winning novels are women? And then if you're writing about little girls, forget it, because little girls have absolutely no value whatsoever. <laughs> and so, but that's an unconscious bias, you know? And so- That's what I mean, um, I mean. So we have to become there's aware- There's a kind of, of hypocrisy. Uh, there's a kind of hypocrisy. I mean, the art world is always talking about open-mindedness. We are so tolerant and so equal and all of that. And uh, at the same time, you see structures that are uh, not fitting to this uh, to this ambition at all. Uh, so I think yeah. there should, should, should be some changes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it can't be that a soldier's violent story is more important than a woman who's experienced domestic violence for 20 years. I mean, you know, those those stories are equal. They have equal value. I mean, uh, and 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 it's and we're starting to learn this and try to figure it out. You know, but I, I do feel that we are moving, thankfully, because of the protests and the awareness towards. Um, realizing that many people have not been able to tell their own stories. And I think that is changing, you know. So I think what we can say is that uh, bi biased was the expression you used, General Kliman, uh, but in a certain way, liberalism was inclined to erase too many differences. And um, I remember the first time I was in India, I was so amazed, a multi-ethnic, multi-religious country. I was so amazed that uh, intellectuals were um, very keen on address problems in a framework of uh, notions like ethnicity, even race, class, gender, religion. It was very normal for them to speak about these things. And I realized that it wasn't in our countries. Um, so how do we learn to speak about differences without denying them, without making them too valuable? Because consensus is also a positive value in a way, no? <laughs> we have to be creative and careful, <laughs> and we have to work a lot with imagination. And you know what, why you were talking about the women situation, uh, the first reaction that I got when I changed my topics and I went to the West Bank and I developed friendship with Palestinians was that I am a prostitute of the Palestinians. And this was my new image as a writer. I became a prostitute as a women writer. It was really easy to put me there. And, you know, it, it's interesting that we think about us that we came from a liberal world I think that under our um, secret um, earth, we deal with more of the same problem, and we have to be aware of that. Uh, it was for me really amazing to hear the story with high heels and music. Well, um, and how does the book become genderless? I mean, how can we have contests? I mean. I'm not at all interested in winning a prize because I'm a woman. I want to win a, win a prize because my book was the best book on the table. Uh, so, you know, I'm not interested in that personally. I just, I don't know how we could recreate a kind of blind judging um, within books, for example, uh, the way that they have done for orchestras, because uh, it's hard. But um, I think it you know, J.K. Rowling, it for ages, people thought was a man. <laughs> I think and her we protagonist see changes. is a boy. Her protagonist is a boy. Let's just yeah. recognize just... that. <laughs> yeah. I think I we will see changes within the cultural sphere only when we see changes within the political sphere. It's obvious that lots of people of these activists call for a representation because they don't feel represented within the classical white canon. And I always wondered, why do they do that? Why uh, don't they call for more representation within the political sphere? Why don't they say, we have our interests and we want to see them within parliament and taken seriously and put into uh, a whole uh, a business where they, in the end they can have their rights uh, secured with uh, within one of these, uh, yeah, one of the bills uh, uh, that, that are made up there. 
And uh, it seems to me that they don't feel that the political sphere is as powerful as they thought it should be, or they think it should be. Because maybe that's an, uh, against, uh, maybe this is again um, uh, um, an aspect, a symptom of this um, so called digital modernism. Uh, with, mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe it's that, the old uh, myth this you was talking about. Yeah, right. Maybe it's uh, that they s it's clearly that someone like uh, Mr. Zuckerberg is much more powerful than someone like Mrs. Merkel in the end. Yeah. Much more Absolutely. able to. Yeah. Behavior, yeah. they they see that there's a democratic lack or a representational lack in a way, and, and they start to f uh, look for other fields to to uh, which they know of that uh, they will find uh, lots of attention if they call for boycott of a certain book or of a certain author they know. And, uh, since they are not heard within the political field, I think that's an idea we have to ventilate a little bit more. Maybe. And the other thing I think we have to recognize, I mean, here we are on a panel on a very sensitive subject, and we're four white people. I mean, that already is, you know, we could say not the best situation. At the same time, we are completely, such completely different human beings. I mean, if we each told our story, we probably could not be more and more different, our traumas, our experiences, you know, everything that has we have lived, we have nothing in common. Um, so, so it's this whole like, thing of, of identity is also very complex, because what you see is not necessarily what is there at all. Um, but it would be good to have a more diverse panel. But you know, it's a good point, but I must say what is really interesting, I, I, in one hand, I'm very optimistic after this conversation because we have a lot of problems to solve. Maybe they will be in another format, but the young generation has to, will have to deal with same, more or less the same problems than, that we mentioned. But on the other end, when I think about culture and literature, I cannot just uh, uh, think about culture without thinking about German culture, which was the core of European culture in a way. And still the discussion is under the Frankfurt book, I say which what was in the past in a way still exists and i try to talk with many uh, arab friends of mine about having a panel a conversation about literature and they told me that there is no way there are young palestinians and young arab guys who are dealing with literature but it would be very difficult. It's it's something new for them in a way to enter to the literature way in our format. They have their own stories and literature, but this is um, the format that was created by white people from Central Europe. And it's still the platform in a way. And that's a huge question, which I ask myself during this conversation. Let me just remind that one of the titles of uh, your Palestinian books is Who the Fuck is Kafka? So that <laughs> says it, I think, as a whole. And um, I would like to close with um, a remark of Achil Membebe, a Cameroonian political theorist who was lately in the shitstorm in Germany. And he underlines that being human means being able to become another and to be open to the suffering and pain of others without having made the experience oneself. So one just can hope that having made the experience is in one day or another, sooner or later, not the own criteria to act towards in the cultural spheres or towards against art and um, artwork, museums, artists, etc. Europe linking cultures, cultures as a link, 
a Frankfurt Book Fair debate with Jennifer Clement, Lissy Doron, and Hanno Rauterberg. I thank you very, very much for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Hope to see you next year in Frankfurt. <laughs>